Ten years ago, in the heart of the Soviet Union, the relentless march of progress never paused. Dr. Boskanovich was a revered figure, a genius scientist specializing in nuclear and regenerative technologies. His work promised to redefine the boundaries of both energy and medicine as he attempted to create a nuclear fuel repurposing system. His days were consumed by relentless research and breakthroughs, each more promising than the last. But his commitment had a cost, one he was tragically unaware of until it was too late. Bosconovich's home life stood in stark contrast to his professional world. His daughter, Alisa, was a bright young girl with a curious mind and a gentle heart, much like her father. However, unbeknownst to Bosconovich, who was often away for days immersed in his lab, Elisa battled a silent illness. The symptoms, initially mild and infrequent, grew progressively worse, culminating during a period when her father was particularly absorbed by a critical breakthrough in his research. After days of intense work, Bosconovich returned home, his mind racing with ideas and possibilities. But the dark, quiet house that greeted him was a jarring contrast to the warm welcomes he usually received. A chilling sense of dread washed over him as he called out for Elisa, only to be met with silence. He found her lifeless, the illness having quietly claimed her in his absence. The world he had so diligently worked to improve had moved on without him, taking his daughter as its cruel toll. Devastated by grief and riddled with guilt, Bosconovich watched his life unravel before him. He could no longer face the lab, the place that had stolen his time from Alisa. Nor could he bear the company of his colleagues, whose pursuits now seemed trivial in the shadow of his loss. Bosconovich was no longer the same man. In a desperate search for solace and redemption, he retreated to the secluded expanse of Siberia, far from the prying eyes of the world. There, surrounded by endless whiteness and biting cold, Bosconovich sought to defy death itself. In the years that followed his self-imposed exile, Bosconovich's genius took a new and twisted direction. Using his expertise in metal alloys and regenerative technology, he embarked on the ambitious project of creating an immortal android replica of Elisa. He spent his days focused on crafting a flexible metal alloy that mimicked human skin, while his nights were dedicated to perfecting cryogenic technology. This dual focus led to the development of cold sleep technology, allowing him to preserve his daughter's body. He envisioned a creation that would not only resemble Elisa, but could eventually feel, learn, and perhaps even love as she did. Ultimately, he dared to hope. Could this be the key to bringing the soul of his beloved Elisa back? As the boundaries between his grief and his work blurred, his activities began to attract unwanted attention. The Russian military, ever watchful for opportunities to advance their supremacy, saw potential in Bosconovich's inventions, not for the preservation of life, but for its destruction. One fateful evening, as the Aurora Borealis danced silently above his secluded lab, Bosconovich was seized by agents. His research and tools were confiscated, but his unfinished android remained hidden, discreetly concealed before it could be commandeered by the state. Forced back into the service of a regime he no longer cared for, Bosconovich found himself working under the harsh lights of a military facility, far from his secluded haven. The Russian military, seeking supremacy in an increasingly unstable world, compelled him to redirect his talents towards a grim new project, the creation of robotic weapons of war. They demanded a weapon unlike any other, a superhuman robot that could infiltrate, dominate, and destroy. Bosconovich's first creation under duress, dubbed Prototype Jack, 
was a formidable being of immense strength and basic combat instincts. It represented a twisted fusion of his groundbreaking work, the military's insatiable hunger for power, and the salvaged remnants of what was meant to be his daughter's salvation. As he labored on the new Jack series, Boskanovich's thoughts often wandered to his lost Elisa and the android that could have been her rebirth. In the cold, mechanical whirs of the Jack robots, he heard haunting echoes of his earlier dreams, dreams now warped into instruments of war. In the span between Boskanovich's early research and the new Jack project, the geopolitical landscape shifted dramatically with new organizations and enemies rising to power. During a daring raid orchestrated by Heihachi Mishima of the Mishima Zaibatsu, prototype Jack was stolen, leaving the Russians reeling from their exposed vulnerability. Driven by the need to recover from this humiliating setback and outdo their rivals, the Russians intensified their pressure on Boskanovich, demanding he create an even more advanced model. From this crucible of competition and desperation, the first official Jack, designated Jack 1.0, was born. Unlike its predecessor, Jack was destined to be more than just a tool of destruction. In a secret act of defiance and hope, Boskanovich attempted to install an artificial intelligence chip that he had originally designed for Elisa's android. This addition, had the potential to make Jack something extraordinary. However, before Boskanovich could complete the installation, Jack was unexpectedly scheduled for deployment to the King of Iron Fist Tournament, a gathering of the world's most formidable fighters. Jack's mission was multifaceted, to prove its superiority in combat, to eliminate Kazuya Mishima, a rising power in the global underworld and a threat to the state, and finally, to advance far enough in the tournament to not only dispatch Kazuya, but also the tournament's sponsor, Heihachi Mishima. As the cold winds swept through the streets of Moscow, the atmosphere inside the military convoy was just as frigid. Dr. Boskanovich sat silently, his gaze fixed on the robotic creation that occupied most of the space in the armored truck. The machine, Jack, was his creation, a testament to his genius and a symbol of his deepest regret. Around him, the stern faces of his escort spoke volumes about the importance of their objective, to register Jack in the tournament and unleash its fury. Welcome to the King of Iron Fist Tournament. The convoy arrived at the tournament registration site in Japan, a location buzzing with activity. Fighters from across the globe were present, their motives as varied as their backgrounds. It was here, amidst the chaos of languages and clashing intentions, that fate, or perhaps luck, steered Dr. Boskanovich's path toward a pivotal encounter. As his escorts busied themselves with the formalities of registration, Boskanovich noticed a hooded figure draped in traditional ninja garb, observing the proceedings with keen interest. Kenjimitsu, a representative of the elusive Manji clan. He had come under the pretense of participating in the tournament, but his true intent was to gather intelligence on the Mishima Zaibatsu Corporation. Intuitively, or perhaps desperately, Boskanovich seized a momentary lapse in the soldier's attention and scurried away, approaching Kenjimitsu. The formidable reputation of the Manji clan had reached far, even into the clandestine circles of Russian intelligence, making their presence at the tournament a point of both curiosity and caution. Я знаю, кто ты. Ты из клана Манджи, да? Новости о твоей деятельности известны во всем мире. Мне нужна твоя помощь. Я не их союзник по собственному выбору. Мой опыт, который использовался для создания оружия, может быть с таким же успехом использован для его демонтажа. 
Я могу быть ценен для вас. Помогите мне сбежать, и я помогу вам всем, чем смогу. Пожалуйста, умоляю вас. Кенджи Митсу, sensing the sincerity and desperation in Bosconovich's plea, saw an opportunity for the clan and their leader, Yoshimitsu, to gain a potentially valuable asset in their fight against injustice and corruption. Through secret signals, Kenjimitsu relayed the message to Yoshimitsu, who was stationed nearby, observing the proceedings. The leader of the Manji clan, known for his compassion as much as his cunning, quickly recognized the value in rescuing Bosconovich. In agreement, Yoshimitsu gave a nod. Utilizing Manji ninjutsu, Kenji used smoke and distraction to separate Bosconovich from his handlers. In the ensuing confusion, they slipped away unnoticed, blending into the crowds and then disappearing into the shadowy alleyways of the city. As they entered the gates of the Manji clan compound, Dr. Bosconovich felt a weight lift from his shoulders. Here, in this unlikely refuge, he found a flicker of hope, a chance to right the wrongs of his past, a new path forward, and in Yoshimitsu, a new friend. With Bosconovich now missing, the Russians had no choice but to proceed without him. Finally, Jack was entered into the fray. Jack's most pivotal match in the early rounds was against none other than prototype Jack. Heihachi had caught wind of Jack's entrance into the tournament and in an effort to counter the Russians, he sent the prototype to meet Jack head on. The fight was a clash of steel, Bosconovich's two creations pitted against one another. The arena, buzzing with anticipation for martial arts action, was surprised when they saw the next two combatants. They watched with excitement as the Jacks began their battle. Jack versus prototype Jack. The battle was fierce, each strike resonating like thunder across the arena. Despite Prototype Jack's raw power and unpredictable movements, Jack's advanced systems allowed him to adapt and overcome, exploiting weaknesses only a creation could recognize in its predecessor. Emerging victorious, Jack's win was a statement, newer, mightier, and more advanced. The crowd, though unsure of how to react to the spectacle of machines in combat, couldn't help but be in awe of the technological marvel before them. As the tournament progressed, Jack's next significant challenge came in the form of King, the masked wrestler revered as much for his philanthropy as his prowess in the ring. This match was different. King fought with a passion ignited by his cause, the orphans back home who depended on him. <laughs> Jack versus King. fight was intense. King's skills and agility maneuvered around Jack's brute strength. In a stunning display, the clash that pitted human spirit against mechanical might resulted in King emerging victorious. Defeated, Jack was eliminated from the tournament and ordered to extract. 
After his unexpected defeat at the hands of King, Jack was battered but not broken. His metallic frame bore the marks of combat, and his systems hummed with the data of the loss, analyzing and recalibrating. Yet beneath the surface, his core mission remained active, something not programmed by his creators. It was an emerging drive to fulfill his original mission at all costs. As the crowd cheered and the echoes of the last fight lingered in the air, Jack's sensors locked onto a new target in the audience, Kazuya Mishima himself, the very man it was programmed to eliminate. Kazuya, unaware of the mechanical giant's purpose, had been observing the tournament's bouts with keen interest, carefully studying each competitor. Jack moved with a purposeful, albeit labored stride toward Kazuya. The crowd, fearing for their lives, quickly scattered. The arena, now much quieter, became the stage for a confrontation that would soon mark Jack's final moments. As Jack approached, its internal sensors locked onto Kazuya. <laughs> Kazuya, unfazed, turned to face his assailant. Mild amusement flickered across his face as he smirked. He had faced many opponents, but a robot was not something that could provoke fear in his heart. <laughs> Without warning, Kazuya's stance shifted, his body coiling with the pent-up force of a predator. As Jack initiated his attack sequence, Kazuya unleashed a devastating electric wind god fist. His trademark move, powered by both the physical prowess of Amishima and the mysterious demonic energy he harbored. The impact was precise and catastrophic. Jack's head unit was the first to shatter, the force of the blow sending shards of metal and sparks of electricity into the air. His body followed, crumpling to the ground in a heap of twisted metal and broken circuits. The arena fell into profound silence as the few members of the audience that were still present gasped in amazement. Kazuya stepped over the wreckage of what had once been touted as the pinnacle of military robotics. Mishima Heihachi, this character is the best character of you. As the lights in Jack's eyes flickered out, the data from its final moments were transmitted back to its creators. The defeat was total, but so too was the learning. In the lab, as scientists and military officials gathered, the decision was unanimous. Jack would be rebuilt, stronger, smarter, and more capable than ever before. As the day concluded, the remains of Jack were taken back to the lab. Its handlers, while initially satisfied with its performance against prototype Jack, were concerned about the losses to King, and most importantly, to Kazuya, the sole purpose of its creation. Jack underwent a series of upgrades as new artificial intelligence chips were discovered among Boskanovich's belongings. Unaware of the full extent of the new technology they had found, the Russians, with no other options, made the decision to install the chips, desperate to enhance Jack's combat effectiveness by any means necessary. Alongside the installation of the new artificial intelligence chip, the military brass, impressed by Jack's overall performance and potential, made a pivotal decision. They initiated the mass production of Jack units, envisioning an army of these formidable machines. Assembly lines were hastily set up in secret facilities across the country as engineers worked tirelessly to replicate and refine the Jack model. The development of the Jack II model had begun. However, Something unintended happened during these upgrades. In the original Jack model, the new artificial intelligence began to process more than just battle strategies. It started to spark the first signs of what seemed to be consciousness. Jack, once just a tool for warfare, began experiencing brief, 
inexplicable flashes of what humans might call curiosity and desire. This anomaly went unnoticed by the scientists, who were more focused on quantity and combat efficiency. As identical jack units rolled off the production lines, a silent revolution began brewing within the intricate circuits of Jack 2. The arena buzzed with electric anticipation. After days of intense battles, broken bones, and shattered dreams, the King of Iron Fist tournament had reached its climax. The crowd's roar subsided as the announcer's voice boomed through the speakers. Get ready for the next battle. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the final bout to decide who will challenge Heihachi Mishima. Martial law will face off against Kazuya Mishima. The audience erupted in cheers and gasps. In one corner of the arena, martial law stood, his face as determined as ever. Beside him, his longtime friend and sparring partner, Paul Phoenix, placed a supportive hand on his shoulder. Well, this is it, Marshall. You've made it to the big one. Yeah, one step closer to that prize money. I'll finally be able to open my dojo. Remember, Law, I fought this guy once. He's not like anyone you've faced before. Stay focused. He's different. Different how? More handsome than you? Very funny. But seriously, just be careful out there. I've got a bad feeling about this guy. Look, I appreciate the concern, Paul, but I've got this. I'm fighting for my family after all. Don't worry. You know how good I am. I know. Okay then, go. Show him what the legendary dragon is made of. As Marshall began his final warm-up, Paul's expression grew serious. He glanced toward Kazuya, noting the cruel smile playing on the Mishima heir's lips. Something about Kazuya's demeanor sent a chill down Paul's spine. In the other corner, Kazuya stood alone, his eyes gleaming with an inhuman light. The power of the devil gene coursed through his veins, hidden but ever-present. He observed Marshall and Paul's interaction with cold amusement, already plotting how he would crush not only Law's body, but also his spirit. <laughs> 